This is ProBlogger. Hi there. Welcome to episode 216 of the ProBlogger podcast. My name's Darren Rouse and I'm the blogger behind ProBlogger.com, a blog, podcast, event, job board and a series of ebooks all designed to help you as a blogger to start a great blog, to grow your audience and to build some profit around that blog. You can learn more about ProBlogger over at ProBlogger.com. Now, I'm just back from Dallas. I've had a few weeks off from the podcast, and it's been great to get some feedback from some of you that you missed the podcast over the last few weeks. Uh, So I'm sorry for the break, but I hope you had a little bit of fun digging around in our archives. As I said, just back from Dallas, and we had an amazing time in Dallas. I was at the FinCon conference where I did the opening keynote and uh, had an absolute ball. There was, uh, I think, around 1,800 uh, financial bloggers, real estate bloggers, there. Um, Really great conference, very good community. And before FinCon, of course, we ran the Success Incubator um, little event that we had as well. We had about 80 or so uh, pro blogger listeners and um, some attendees from the previous Digital Collab events. And it was fantastic. We had this uh, full day of training. We started, I think, about 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning and went through to uh, about 9.30 at night. It was a big day. And that was packed with teaching. We had Pat Flynn, Kim Gast, Andrea Val, we had Rachel Miller. Um, Kelly Snyder, a variety of other um, bloggers as well. And the con- the feedback we had on that day of teaching was fantastic. People loved how intense it was, the fact that we packed in so much information. Um, so that was great. And then we had half a day of masterminding the next day, which I always love, uh, that opportunity to sit around this table with bloggers and online entrepreneurs and brainstorm. Um, you can still pick up virtual tickets for that event if you go to problogger.com forward slash success. Um, I think they're $127 US and that gets you the first day, that first full day of teaching. I think there's about eight hours of teaching and you get the slides as well. Uh, that price will go up. So it's um, uh, it's not an early bird one because um, it's now after the event, um, but um, it will go up uh, in the coming days as well. So you get some teaching there on live video creation from Kim Gast, uh, Pat Flynn's teaching on creating an editorial calendar promotional calendar for your business. You get some uh, training on Facebook advertising, um, using challenges to grow your blog, um, how to sell courses. Um, Steve Chu did an amazing session, which I picked up so much information on how he promotes his courses using webinars and Facebook advertising. So it's really practical teaching. um, And uh, again, you can check out the agenda there at problogger.com forward slash success. Okay, so on to today's episode. Today, I want to talk about style guides, um, how to create them for your blog and why you should create them for your blog as well. Um, Style guides, in my opinion, are one way that you can really lift a good blog to a great blog by building more consistency across uh, your content uh, across from one blog post to another. So um, you can grab today's show notes with a full transcription of this episode at problogger.com forward slash podcast forward slash two one six and uh, lastly i should say on our events stay tuned uh, for news of future events both in australia and hopefully in the u.s Um, we'll hopefully have some news for you that on that in the coming weeks and even months um, as we begin to plan 2018 thanks for listening and uh, let's get on to today's show creating great content finding an audience Building engagement. Monetizing your blog. This is Pro Blogger. So today we're talking about style guides. I want to talk about why you need them and also how to create one. I want to to give you some practical things that you could include in your style guide for your blog. Now, what is a style guide? Um, Really, as I've talked to different bloggers, they mean different things to different people. Some people, a style guide is purely about the writing on your blog. It uh, it could be the, the writing style guide. Other bloggers include a lot more. They will include things like how to use graphics and how the blog should look look in terms of colors and the brand. And really, I guess it can be whatever it um, is for you. But the main reason you want a style guide for your blog is to build consistency um, in your blog. 
Uh, most blogs, if you dig around in them, you'll begin to see inconsistencies. And this naturally happens. You know, I look back on the early days of ProBlogger and I look at those first posts I wrote and they were all text. There was no images in them at all. So that's a big change that's happened in blogging. Now, I started blogging in 2002, 2004 for ProBlogger. Of course, things have changed. You know, the style of um, my writing has probably matured in that time. And so there's going to be some inconsistencies through your archives, but Bloggers run into trouble when um, one blog post that you write uh, today is different in style and in in how it looks to tomorrow's blog post. Uh, That's the kind of inconsistencies that many blogs have without even knowing it, and a style guide can really help uh, a lot. It will, um, something that really um, can help your readers to feel like they're reading a unified uh, publication. You know, if you open a magazine, the the magazine is designed in a way the reader feels like that even though there's different articles that they belong next to each other. Um, And that's the type of thing that you want to be doing in your blog post as well. So stated most simply, a style guide is where you put into writing the guidelines for how you want your blog to be written and presented. And the reason you want to do it is to bring this consistency This is the type of thing that you've probably already got without even knowing it. You've probably got a style guide in your mind. And most bloggers have one in their mind. Um, And it's just because most blogs start out being written by one person. And uh, this is why many of us don't actually feel like we need a style guide in the early days because we we think that we're consistent. <laughs> you know, we think that oh, well, if I'm the only one writing this blog, then it's going to be consistent from blog post to the next blog post. But the reality is, if you dig around in your archives, and I challenge you to do this, you'll begin to spot inconsistencies. And so I think it's really important to bed down the style that you want into writing, to actually bed it down because you will begin to see these inconsistencies in your own writing. And particularly if you want to add new writers into your blog, whether they're just one-off guest posters or whether you want to bring on a, um, a regular writer, this is where a style guide really becomes even more useful as well. So the trouble I see with many blogs is you um, look through the archives and you can see these inconsistencies. And so the inconsistencies that you want to be looking for on your blog as you look through your archives, um, the voice of your writing, um, what style do you use? Um, And uh, look, there's a natural kind of exploration of different voices that will happen on many blogs. But generally, over time, you want to become a bit more consistent with the the voice that you use. Um, Are you writing in the first person? Are you um, conversational in your writing? Are you writing for beginners or are you writing? writing for a more advanced or audience. As I say, there's some variation in this is, is fine and is natural, but as your blog progresses, you'll probably want to stick to one voice more and more. Um, other areas of inconsistency, capitalization of words in headlines, for example. And I see this all the time. You see one blog post that uh, all the main words are capitalized, and then you look at the next blog post, and it's just the first letter of the headline is capitalized, and the rest of it is in lowercase. Um, that um, may not really irk you, but I bet there are some of your readers who are wondering what's going on there and they notice that type of thing, even if you don't. Um, Grammatical rules. Um, For example, when I write pro blogger, I capitalize P and B, pro blogger, um, even though I present it as one word. Uh, As long as that's consistent, that's fine. Um, That becomes part of your brand. So you might have those type of things as well. Um, On Digital Photography School, we call that that blog DPS. The D is generally lowercase and the P and the S are uh, are capitals and that becomes part of the brand. But we want to be consistent in that way. It sort of sets us apart, I guess, in some ways from other people who use DPS and there's other sites out there who do. Another word that we use a lot both on ProBlogger and on D- uh, Digital Photography School, is ebook. An ebook is presented in all kinds of different ways on the web. Some people do a, a little uh, lowercase e and then an uppercase b and then present it as one word. Other people hyphenate um, and have it um, lowercase. Um, other people just do it lowercase the whole word. So uh, having consistency in that way is important. And I see some bloggers who use that word ebook and they will um, capitalize it differently even within the one article. <laughs> 
which, uh, again, I, it doesn't really annoy me that much, but I know there would be other people who would be um, having conniptions about that. So use of images and graphics is another one, and I, uh, this is something I know I'm guilty of um, from time to time, uh, you know, having consistency in the way you use images. Uh, if you put typeface on your words, uh, sort of words on your images, um, do you have consistency in the fonts you use, the colors that you use, um, the way you use headlines, the way you use um, lists and block quotes, and the way you spell words as well? Do you use a US spelling, American spelling, or do you use a British spelling? Um, and uh, this really comes into play when you've got more than one author as well. So all of these things can present inconsistencies. And whilst you might look at them all individually and just say they're small things, they add up. And generally over time, they can really become a big thing. Um, so most single author blogs, you, you'll find that most of you will probably have a certain amount of consistency because you write the, the way you write. And so you will um, generally from post to post have some consistency. But even single author blogs do change over time. And it really does come into play when you have more than one author on your blog. For example, on Digital Photography School, uh, we have uh, a lot of writers. We have about 40 writers. We publish 14 articles a week. And so there's a lot of opportunity there, there for inconsistency because our writers come from across the world, even just on the spelling front. We've got writers who come from America. We've got writers who come from England, writers who come from Australia, and there's um, different um, spelling of words. Um, and then we've got readers who come from all of those places as well. And so to make a decision up front that we are going to use the American spelling because that's where most of our auth uh, readers come from and most of our authors as well brings some consistency to that. And whilst it's not going to suit all of our readers, um, at least our readers will see that we're consistent in that. When you've got 14 posts a week from 14 different authors, there's incredible potential for a very messy looking blog in terms of the writing, but also how things are presented. So style guides do become more important as you add more people into your blog, but I think they're still important even if you're a single writer, um, a single author blogger, because you will find naturally over time that you will change. Uh, some of your style as well. You're listening to Pro Blogger. So, how do you create this simple style guide for your blog? What should you include? How detailed should it be? As I mentioned earlier, it's going to vary a lot from blog to blog. I know some bloggers, for instance, who have a style guide and they keep it purely to writing, how, how the writing on the blog should appear, whilst other bloggers include more broader guidelines like um, what brand colors should be used. Now, some people have two style guides for the two different things. They have a, a brand style guide and a writing style guide. I think it's okay to merge those things a little bit together. And so what I want to present to you today is a simplified one. I want to give you um, five, four or five different areas that you want to make some decisions about and um, create a little document. And I'm thinking here that you could create a document that is maybe one to two pages long. You don't need anything more detailed than that to start with. You will find, though, over time that you can evolve this document, and I think it should be a living document because you will find over time um, that um, there will be more opportunity to add new things in, partly because you might start using different technologies or you might um, add in different types of content, so you may add in some video over time, or there'll be new opportunities to add in new authors who will bring up different things for you. So this is a living document. Um, but what I want to give you are some things to include at the beginning of the creation of this. So, four or so th things to include. The first one is a short description of your audience. I think who is reading your blog really should be the basis for most of the decisions you are making regarding content and what is in this style guide. So, ideally, what you want to create is some kind of avatar or persona or reader profile for your blog. I talked about this in episode 33, um, where I actually talked through how to create an avatar for your blog. And we actually did a, an article on ProBlogger recently that gave you a template for creating an avatar for your blog. So I think that's a useful exercise to do. You may not want to include that full avatar in your writing um, uh, style guide, but 
at least referring to it and including a sentence or two about who you are writing for, because ultimately that should be informing all the decisions that you make. So include a sentence or two about who is reading your blog and maybe refer to that avatar if you've done that exercise. That's point number one. Number two is to, uh, again, just in a few sentences, describe the voice that you want your um, content to be written in or the tone. How do you want your content to sound or come across to your readers? Even if you just brainstorm a few words of that would describe the type of content that you want to create. For example, do you want your, your content to be conversational or do you want it to be authoritative or do you want it to be humorous? Do you want it to be sophisticated, educational, friendly, irreverent, comprehensive. These words will begin to help you and any other writers you may bring on to understand the tone that you want, the voice that you want in your content. Now, over time, you're probably going to say, I want all of those types of uh, content on my blog, and that's totally fine um, on a blog, but generally you will want to keep some consistency on it. And over time, you'll want more and more of your content to kind of fit into a certain style. And that's going to help your readers to uh, engage with you and to build a relationship with you um, and uh, to learn from you more as well. So a few sentences there on your voice. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about developing your voice, you might want to go back and listen to episode 166 of the ProBlogger podcast, where I give you 15 types of voices that you can write in. But even just doing that brainstorm of a few words that would describe the voice that you want to write in um, can be useful as well. And there's, there's no reason why you can't change that later. This is a starting point for you. Creating great content and building your audience. This is ProBlogger. So number one was to describe your audience. Number two is to describe the voice, the tone of your writing. Number three, we want to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of things and to talk about spelling and grammar which I know some of you are squirming about, and I'm one of those people. It doesn't come naturally to me. I'm not a details person, but I think it's important to um, address this. Now, most larger publications, most media would adopt the spelling and grammatical guidelines of uh, an external style guide. There actually are um, whole style guides that have been been written. Um, So one very common one is the AP style guide. And I'll link to this in the show notes today. There's another one called the Chicago Manual of Style. And again, I'll link to that today. Um, Both of these you can buy. Um, I think the AP style guide, a style book, for example, is pretty affordable. I think it's twenty two ninety five US for the print edition, um, and I think there's an online version of, of it as well, which is about twenty five dollars. So it may be that you want to get that, and it basically, as you look through them, they uh, are very extensive outlines of all the rules of grammar and spelling that you might come across. And uh, many media will just say we adopt the AP style book um, or we adopt that Chicago Manual of Style and they um, give all their writers access to these books so that if there's ever a question of what they should be um, including uh, or how they should be spelling a word or how they should be using grammar, they can just refer to that. Now, this may be overkill if you are just a single author blog. Or you may actually want to do that if if that's something for you. Um, If it's overkill for you, you, all you really need in this section is to address the um, some of these types of things. So, firstly, spelling. Do you adopt American or British spelling? And this will probably be determined by who you are and who your author and who your readers are as well. Uh, So I'm an Australian. So if I was writing for an Australian um, readership, I'd probably adopt the British spelling because that's the way Aussies tend to go. But I have predominantly US readers. And so I have adopted the American spelling, even though it doesn't come naturally for me. It's something that I do need to edit um, myself on. Um, Other things that you might want to include in the spelling and grammar section of your style guide are things around punctuation and capitalization. For example, the use of commas 
Um, and I'm not going to go into the, the debates around the use of commas. Um, this is perhaps a discussion for another day. There are People get very fired up about commas, and I don't really want to get into that today. But as long as you've got a consistent use of commas, um, that's important. The use of capitalization in headlines, um, the use of exclamation marks. I know some bloggers hate exclamation marks, and they don't allow them on their blogs. Uh, you may uh, choose to do something else. So anything around punctuation, capitalization should be included. The use of numbers. So will you use numerals or will you spell them out? Um, That may be something that you want to include in this section. Particularly pay attention to any regularly used troublesome words, words where, um, uh, like ebook, for example, where um, there can be a lot of inconsistency. So if you're using the word ebook, um, or if you have a brand name like ProBlogger where you capitalize the P and the B, you want to include that type of thing in this section as well. You might also want to include um, guidelines around the use of acronyms, particularly if you're in a, um, a niche or a topic where acronyms are used a lot. How are you going to introduce an acronym in a uh, in an article? Um, for example, you may choose to explain the acronym when you first use it in an article. So um, you might want to, um, if, if it was AOL, I know it's a bit of an old-fashioned one, uh, the first time you use that acronym in the article, you may want to have in brackets what that means uh, and, and actually spell out the words. And then from then on, just use the an- a- acronym. So these are the types of things that you can include into um, uh, your spelling and grammar section of um, your style guide. How to build and monetize your blog. This is ProBlogger. The fourth section that I would include you to think about is more about uh, how you want your content to look um, and some other factors as well. And this I've kind of just lumped into an other style, style guidelines section. So um, let's talk about images in your article. Um, uh, how many should your article have? Um, for example, on ProBlogger, we um, always want an image. On Digital Photography School, we always want an image. And that is part of our style guide. We, we have to have an image. And so anyone writing for us has to help us find that image. So should there be an image? How many images are okay? You might want to have a limit on how many images. It's up to you. Um, how should those um, images be captioned? Do you want captions on every image, only where the image requires a caption? Um, And also, how do you want to attribute uh, the photographers uh, of those images? Do you want to do that in the caption or do you want to do it somewhere else in the article? These are the types of things that you might want to include into your style guide. How big should images be? How many pixels? How how they should be aligned? Do you want them to be full width? Do you want them to be aligned left, to be aligned right? Um, Where can people source them? You may even want to include which um, stock library you um, use and give details there for people. Um, Also, the use of typeface in images. So if you're doing graphic overlays, what fonts should be used? What colors should be used? Um, These are things that can really be mixed up a lot and um, you can end up with a very messy looking blog because you've got uh, lots of inconsistencies there. Uh, Do you want your logo to be included in those text overlays? So these are the types of things that will um, really have a big impact upon um, the visualization of your content and how people see your content and what they feel about it as a result. You might want to also include in there that you want very dark images or you want very light, washed out kind of images. Those types of stylistic considerations may come into play there as well. Other things that you might want to include are around your headlines or titles. Um, For example, how long do you want them to be? Do you uh, have rules around the length of them? Some people um, do that for SEO considerations. They don't want long um, headlines. Do you want headlines that are uh, more keyword rich, um, more descriptive, or do you want more curiosity, sort of clickbaity type headlines? These are the types of things that you might want to include. And the length of paragraphs might be something. Do you want um, uh, short paragraphs? Are you okay with longer paragraphs? Um, uh, I know a couple of bloggers who actually have word li- limits or how many lines the paragraph should take up because they don't want their, their paragraphs to be too long. Um, the use of lists. Do you require numbers or bullets? Or are you okay with either? 
the use of headings or subheadings, um, which H tag should you use? Um, this is really useful for anyone who's coming onto your blog. Um, most people know how to use a H tag, but uh, you may have some rules around um, you know, what order they should be in or how many H2 tags or how many H3 tags you might wanna have. It's getting a little bit technical here, but these are the types of questions that some of your authors will have over time. Um, you might want to include things around how to use bold or italics or underline or strike through. Um, I, I personally don't like strike through in my text on my uh, on my blog. Underlining is something I don't generally do, but bold and italics, uh, we allow for some emphasis, um, but within reason. We don't want every third word being bold or um, uh, in italics. The use of block quotes, um, how to cite sources. Do you want to use... Um, uh, quotes? Do you want to um, put all quotes in block quotes? Um, and also th um, guidelines around linking as well. So do you want to have no follow tags on your links or only when they're paid uh, sponsorship type things? So all of these questions, it's important to include in there so that as a, as a writer is you know, creating content, they can be um, having their questions answered without having to keep coming back to you all the time. Uh, it's going to cut down the work that you have to do in editing the content but also it's going to speed up their writing process as well. You might want to include word count limits if you um, want all articles to be over 500 words or maybe you want all articles to be over 2,000 words. It really, again, is going to um, help to bring some consistency to your content. Embeddable content, do you, you allow people to embed content? So um, YouTube videos or Vimeo um, videos or even social media, um, do you um, require that type of thing? I know some bloggers that every post they have, they want to have some embeddable content. Um, so again, there's, there's all of these things can be factors for you. You may look at this list that I've created and you'll be able to see it all in, um, in the show notes today. And you may say, well, this is overkill. I don't need to go into to this detail, um, but it, over time, you probably will find that you will include most of these things, particularly if you're adding new authors, because you'll find authors will bring their own style and some of it will clash with what you just assume everyone will want to do as well. You're listening to Pro Blogger. Other things that you might want to include in your style guide are things that you want your authors to do after they've written their post. For example, if you have a plugin like uh, Yoast, so the SEO plugin, if you've got that, you'll be familiar with some of the additional fields that are in the back end of your WordPress. For example, you have the ability to write a particular title and description just for Facebook or for just for Twitter. You may want to do that yourself, or you might want to ask your authors to do that as well. Um, so if there's anything that in there like um, click to tweet plugins, um, you might want to include those. Do you want the author to do that? So in your style guide, you might want to include a little checklist of other things that you want people to do as well. You might also want uh, to get your authors to um, find further reading uh, from your archives and link to those. You might want to have some guidelines around choosing categories or tags um, or anything else that you might want to do around SEO. So do you want them to use certain keywords in a certain number of times? And also some guidelines around author bios as well. So all of these are factors that you might want to include in your style guide. Um, the thing I would say to you is, if you're listening to this and thinking this is just overkill, that's okay. You can start with a very simple one. You might just want to have in yours your audience, who they are, the voice that you've got, the spelling that you use, and that may be enough for the early days. And then you can begin to add in extra things as you think of them, as you come up with um, potential inconsistencies in your blog. A really simple exercise that you might want to try is just to go back through your archives and dig back to this time last year, if you've been blogging for a while, um, and look at some of the articles that you've got in your archives and just look for those inconsistencies. Maybe randomly choose 10 of your posts and look back through them 
pay attention to the images, the way you've used images. Pay attention to your headlines. Pay attention to the introductions or the conclusions of your articles. You begin to see over time that things in your archives grate on you. Things in your archives you'll cringe at a little bit and they will be signals to you that um, they're things that you might want to um, put into your style guide that you don't want people to do um, as they write for your blog. Um, Create this style guide and put it in a place which you can easily refer back to yourself. Um, and if, as you bring on authors, build it into your orientation for new authors as well. So on Digital Photography School, we've now got a, a fairly comprehensive style guide, but it also includes other things that we want our authors to know. So we've kind of created a, almost like a guidebook that we give to any new author who comes on. And it answers things like style guides, but also shows them how to um, submit Submit posts to to be edited, um, and how to log in, and how to set up their author bio. These types of things as well. So um, we've actually created a little orientation system that our editor is able to walk a new writer through. So you want your style guide to be easy to refer to, easy to edit, and uh, as I said it right up front, you want it to be a living document. And uh, involve your writers. If you do have a team, involve them in the creation of the style guide as well and make note of any question they ask you. As a new author comes on, any question they ask you is probably a question that someone else is going to ask you later on. So include the answers in your style guide in that orientation book as well. It does take a little bit of work to set up a style guide, but it's the type of thing that is going to improve your content um, over time. It's going to um, reduce the tension and and the um, the clashes that your readers have with your content as well over time. There are a certain segment of your your readership who will notice this type of thing, and if you can remove these little barriers um, for them engaging with your content, it's going to have a massive impact over time, and it's going to help you to come across as a much more professional publication as well. So work hard on setting it up. And then I guess the other part of it is work hard on being consistent and actually adopting the style that you set down as well. Thanks for listening. I've got today's show notes over at problogger.com forward slash podcast forward slash 216. And I've also included today in um, the show notes some further um, reading and some further listening. I actually did a podcast with Beth Dunn uh, a little while ago on um, how to write in a more human-like way, how to sound more human in your your writing. And we talk a little bit in that um, episode about style guides. So um, go and listen to that one as well. And also there's uh, three articles there that have been written by um, the team at Canva, another one um, by the team at Buffer, and another one by the team at HubSpot, which really do give you some really good ideas for how to create a style guide. And some of them even have templates plates that you can fill in as well. So check out the podcast show notes today at problogger.com forward slash podcast forward slash 216 for that further reading and for a summary of what I've talked about today. Thanks so much for listening. I'd love to hear what you think about today's episode. You can leave a comment on those show notes or check us out on Facebook at the ProBlogger community group and uh, there'll be a link there where you can uh, share your comments on today's episode as well if you've got any questions or other suggestions to add. Thanks for listening and I look forward to chatting with you next week in episode 217 of the Pro Blogger podcast. You've been listening to Pro Blogger. If you'd like to comment on any of today's topics or subscribe to the series, find us at problogger.com forward slash podcast. Tweet us at problogger. Find us at facebook.com forward slash problogger or search problogger on iTunes. Before I go, I want to give a big shout out and say thank you to Craig Hewitt and the team at Podcast Motor, who've been editing all of our podcasts for some time now. Podcast Motor have a great range of services for podcasters at all levels. They can help you to set up your podcast, but also offer a couple of excellent services to help you to edit your shows and get them up with great show notes. Check them out at podcastmotor.com.